At first I can't stand up I hear the soft ticking of my watch But I can't read the time I can't see straight I realise that my left eye is swollen shut I can only see through a narrow slit in my right eye My glasses have disappeared Welcome to the Extraordinary Stories Podcast Okay, hi, hello, welcome along. Uh, this is the Extraordinary Stories podcast with me, Barry Henderson. This is a podcast where you will hear some of the craziest stories that you've ever heard. Welcome if you are a new listener, thanks for coming along. And if you're a returning listener, well, thanks for coming back. Each episode, I'll be taking you through a brand new story, be it true crime, extreme survival, stories of tangled webs of deceit, or sometimes just the outright weird. Murder, wrongful convictions, secrets unearthed, and really all that lies in between that. Those stories that you just find utterly delicious. I love a good story, and an extraordinary story gives me joy. Okay, let's go. So this story centres around Julianne Kopke and her just incredible, incredible story. In 1971, 17-year-old Julianne was a German-Peruvian high school senior student studying in Lima. She was intending to become a zoologist like her parents. She and her mother, an ornithologist, Maria Kopke, were travelling to meet with their father, who was a biologist called Hans Wilhelm, and at the time he was working in the city of Pukalapa. On December 24th, 1971, Julianne, aged 17, and her mother boarded a flight in Lima bound for Pukalapa. I'm probably not saying that correctly, I'm really sorry if I'm not... um, Yeah, that's kind of the best I can do um, to try and say that. So I'm sorry if it's wrong, but it looks to me like Pukalapa. So, Julianne and Maria were returning to visit Hans for Christmas. Julianne was very much looking forward to seeing her father. During the flight, the plane entered a severe thunderstorm. The commercial airliner was struck by lightning repeatedly whilst flying over the Amazon rainforest and would eventually break up in midair before completely disintegrating at 10,000 feet. Julianne describes these events and the following text are her own words. The plane was jumping. It was dark and we could see lightning around the plane. I was trying to calm my mother down. She was upset And the other passengers too were upset. Panic had set in to us all. There was crying, screaming, weeping and praying. The luggage compartment had flown open and contents were flying around the cabin. Christmas cakes and parcels were everywhere. We remained in the storm for a further ten minutes. Julianne at this point describes seeing a very bright light flashing around the plane and there being a moment of calm. It was at this point that her mother turned to her and said the words, That's it. It's all over now. These were the last words Julianne's mother ever spoke. What happened next happened quickly. The plane jumped up once more and then it nosedived. The screaming in the cabin became the loudest it had been. Then the cabin went pitch black. Julianne says, The noise of screaming 
and of the plane descending at high speed filled my head completely. And then the noise stopped. I was suddenly outside the plane. I was still in my seat. I was free falling. I remember that I felt completely alone in that moment. Now while she might have felt alone, right there at that moment, what was to come for Julianne would make her face what being alone really meant. Asked by a journalist what she felt in the moment of falling, she responded, it was impossible to feel fear or panic. While falling, Julianne saw from the air a canopy in the jungle and she knew she was headed for it. It was at this moment she became unconscious. She says, I awoke the next day at 9am and I looked around. My first thought was, I survived a plane crash. When I regained consciousness, I'd landed in the middle of the jungle. My seatbelt is unfastened, so I must have woken up at some point. I crawled deeper into the sheltering back of the three-seat bench that was fastened to me when I fell from the sky. Wet and muddy, I lay there for the rest of the day and the night. So when I return to either telling people this story, which I often love to do, this Julianne Kopke story is one of my absolute favourites, or even just thinking about it myself, which I do quite a lot, I often think about this moment. I know she said that, that when she was falling it was impossible to feel fear, But in that moment, she must have been fucking terrified. 17 years old in the jungle. You've literally just fallen from a plane and you've landed. And part of that plane seat is still around you. And you're exhausted. And you're in shock. And you're alone. She says, At first, I can't stand up. I hear the soft ticking of my watch, but I can't read the time. I can't see straight. I realise that my left eye is swollen shut. I can only see through a narrow slit in my right eye. My glasses have disappeared. Julianne had a severe concussion, a broken collarbone, deep cuts on her legs and upper arms and the ligaments in her left knee were ruptured. She was, however, able to walk, not easily, of course, but at least she could move. The cuts on her arms and her legs had to be left alone as she had no way to treat them. Now, it's at this point, it is worth saying that although she's in a horrific situation at this moment, the one positive thing that Julianne did have going for her was that she'd had previous experience of the rainforest, which is very lucky, very lucky for her. Her parents had a biological research facility which was in the rainforest and they had worked at it for a year and a half when Julianne was younger. And of that time, she says, Living there, I learned about the rainforest. It's not the green hell the world often thinks. So, back to where Julianne is now. What did she do next? She went in search of other survivors. Now, at this time, she could hear the search planes flying over her but unable to see her. I mean, I can't imagine how frustrating that must be to know that those helicopters are circling above because they're looking for any sign of the plane. They're looking for survivors. But the rainforest is obviously so dense that seeing her was absolutely impossible. She says, I was very angry. The plane had crashed into so many pieces It was impossible for the helicopters to see it. Intense anger overcame me. How can the pilots turn around? Soon, my anger gives way to a terrible despair. So just to paint a picture of what she's wearing at this time, because this is important. She has on a short sleeveless mini dress. And if you go and search for her, actually, you'll find 
um, pictures of her with the dress, which I think that she, I think she still has that dress. I'll, I'll put up some pictures on the Facebook page or the Instagram page. Um, but yeah, you can you can see the dress that she's that she's wearing. It's it is short. There's no sleeves on it. It's you know it's a small mini dress. It's absolutely not going to cover her from any of the elements that she's going to um, be facing in the rainforest. Her glasses had been smashed when the crash happened and she only has one white sandal on her left foot. So being really short-sighted and in need of her glasses at all times, Julianne had to move through the dense area of trees and grass, always putting her left foot first in case she should stand on anything deadly. She says, I couldn't see snakes or animals in my path. I had the luck that I didn't meet them. Now, this is extreme luck, obviously, at this point. Now, I know I said a minute ago she was familiar with what was in the rainforest and probably had a good idea of what would be deadly and what wouldn't. But not to encounter a snake or another deadly animal is just, it's just incredible luck for her at this moment. So, here's what she does next. She says, I found a fault, a small creek and I followed it. I went into the creek knowing it would be relatively safe. In case you're wondering about um, food at this point, which was it's one of the things I kept thinking about, about how was she surviving? Near where she had woken up from the plane crash, she found a bag of sweets which she kept with her and she had been slowly eating. But after four days, the sweets had run out and she had nothing else to eat. She was extremely dehydrated and she drank as much from the creek as possible. And in her own words, she says... I was very, very scared I would starve to death. On the fifth day of walking, she heard a sound which chilled her to the bone. The sound of vultures circling. Did she think they were coming for her? No. She knew that vultures only come for dead bodies. They only land when there is a great deal of carrion. So she continued to follow the curve of the creek and it was there that she saw the first physical piece of the plane that she had been in. She saw a small three-seater bench which had hit the ground at such speed that it was rammed a metre deep into the ground. The bodies of the passengers were still attached to the bench and all three were dead. Julianne says It was one of the most terrible moments. It was the first moment I had ever seen a corpse. It was strange but in that moment I thought one might be my mother. I approached. I touched the feet of the corpses with a stick. But none of these were my mother. So at this point she's losing strength at every minute. She's drifting in the water and she's finding walking incredibly difficult. I was in a parallel universe, away from all human beings. I was ready to give up. I was feeling weak, despairing, lonely. Surrounded by a heavy feeling. Each night when the sun sets, I search for a reasonably safe spot on the bank where I can try to sleep. Mosquitoes and small flies called midges, if you're Scottish you know what a midge is, buzz around my head and try to crawl into my ears and nose. Even worse are the nights when it rains. Ice cold drops pelt me, soaking my thin summer dress. The wind makes me shiver to my core. On those bleak nights, as I cower under a tree or a bush, I feel utterly abandoned. By day I go on swimming, but I'm getting weaker. I drink a lot of river water which fills my stomach, but I know I should eat something. One morning I feel a sharp pain in my upper back. When I touch it, my hand comes away bloody. The sun has burned my skin as I swim. I will learn later 
that I have second degree burns. Okay, now something positive happens. Julianne came across a boat. So looking for shelter by the side of the creek, she saw a boat. Now at first she thought she was hallucinating. She describes it like an adrenaline shot. She approaches the boat slowly and she touches it. And it wasn't a hallucination, it was real. She says, I swim over and touch it. Only then can I believe it. I notice a beaten trail leading up from the bank to the river. I'm sure I'll find people there, but I'm so weak that it takes me hours to make it up the hill. So the position of the boat that she found led to a path which she followed for a short distance and she travelled down it. And as she kept travelling, she found something that was utterly delightful for her. She found a hut that was made of palm trees. The hut was empty, but it was clear to her that people lived there. If you are squeamish, you might not enjoy this next part of the story, although I think it's worth telling because it's another great example of the will to survive that um, Julianne has shown so far. Um, You may remember that I said earlier that she had cuts on her upper arms. Well, those had now become infected and she had maggots in the wounds. So, in thinking how to deal with this, she began to look around the hut and see if there was anything she could find to deal with the infection in her arm. And what she finds is a barrel with gasoline in it. She says, I used the gasoline to treat the wounds. Now, she remembers at this point the family dog, um, who once had maggots in its leg, and how her father had used gasoline rather than alcohol to treat the dog, and so she decided to do the same with her arm. She got the gasoline tank, she opened it, and she poured it directly into the wound. She describes how she felt an excruciating pain as the maggots, 30 of them, fuck's sake, 30 of them, left her body. Having spent the night in the empty hut, Julianne woke the next morning and was about to hear a sound which would be the sweetest she had heard in 11 days. It was the sound of human voices. At first, she heard a single male voice, then a second, and then a third. She describes the moment of hearing them like hearing the voices of angels. A group of men approached the hut, saw her, and said nothing. They stood perfectly still, and they stared at her. After a moment, They slowly approached her and she spoke to them in Spanish. She explained her situation as best she could. Now these men knew that a plane had crashed, but they didn't assume there was any survivors. Later that day, two more men arrived and there were five in total. Between the five of them, they treated her wounds, they gave her food, and on the next day, they carried her back to civilization. Julianne was taken immediately to hospital where she was treated for dehydration, infection, exhaustion and shock. She was moved around a few hospitals in order to receive the best treatment possible. Now while still in hospital, she was reunited with her father. And these are her own words. I couldn't believe it was possible to see him once more. He said, how do you do? We hugged. We didn't speak about what happened. It was later he asked for the details. So at this point, Julianne's father, seeing that she had been able to survive the crash, then became convinced that surely his wife must also have survived and must still be in the rainforest alive and in need of rescue. So he contacted authorities and they searched 
all of the areas that Julianne could describe and he felt sure that his wife and perhaps others from the crash had survived and just needed to be found. However, on the 12th of January, her father had visited all of the corpses that were brought from the rainforest and one of those he identified as his wife. Doctors concluded that Julianne's mother had indeed survived the crash, but she was so heavily injured that after a few days she had died. Julianne says, I do not want to think about her last days. A total of 91 people, including Julianne's mother, had died in the plane crash. Over time, Julianne made a full recovery and was able to carry on making a life for herself. She returned years later to the site of the crash to make a documentary. It's uh, called Wings of Hope, I think is the name of the documentary. You'll find it on YouTube. Um, it's really interesting. It's worth watching. Um, it's, worth, it's worth just seeing her return to that place. And at first, I read an interview with her where she said at first she absolutely did not want to to return back to that place at all, but that she felt it was a good way for her to move on from the experience and also um, manage, she says, manage public interest. I mean, you can imagine the amount of press, the amount of people who wanted to speak to her, to interview her, to ask for her side of the story was overwhelming for her at this point. So she felt this documentary was a way to... To deal with that. Now one of the questions I've got here is. How in the hell would you ever. I mean would you ever get back in a plane. Could you ever get back in a plane. I mean I'm really not sure that I would. I'm not sure I would be desperate to. Uh, to suddenly find myself <laughs> flying again. However she did. And unbelievably she had to fly the same route. Back to Lima. The same route uh, where this had all happened. She had to fly that back with her father. And she says it was terrifying. Just imagine what must have been going through her head at that time. That's unbelievable that she was able to do that. Perhaps transport-wise there was no other way for her to to get back to her life. But um, yeah, I just think it takes such bravery at that point to set foot back on a plane. So, happy to report that Julianne is still alive today. Uh, She went on, after the ordeal that she'd been through, to study at the University of Kiel. She now works primarily with bats and (laughs) serves as the librarian at the Bavarian State Zoological Collection in Munich. And so concludes the story of Julianne. Okay, so what is it that I find so extraordinary about this story? Well, I'm sure it's pretty obvious. The sheer strength and the will it takes to survive what she did, I think, is just amazing. Stories which involve a lot of human emotion and strength always fascinate me. And I think it's fair to say that Julianne must have gone through every emotion possible. I mean, there must have been such dark moments for her in those 11 days there must have been such sadness in those 11 days and wondering and questioning and just a whole range of emotions that we all probably go through in a lifetime but to go through them I think at such an extreme heightened level over 11 days it's just incredible that she was able to uh, to, to stay strong enough to get out of that situation. Okay, that's nearly it for me, except to say that if you do want to reach out to me, you can do it in the following ways. So there's a Facebook group, um, it's Extraordinary Stories Podcast. I'm on Twitter, it's at Extra Stories Pod. I'm on Instagram, you'll find me there, it's Extraordinary Stories Podcast. Or you can email me, please do. I would love to hear from you. It's Extraordinary Stories Podcast at gmail. Dot com. Okay, thank you so much for listening. And as always, if you know a story worth sharing, please let me know.
Okay. Goodbye. It didn't, it didn't affect me really one way or the other. <laughs> I would imagine from the look on his face. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over.